familiar with the name Kenny Loggins? Now that can be a rhetorical question if you like, or you could just blink if you know, because I know I can't see anyone on Zoom back home. Well, Kenny Loggins, for those who don't know, just happened to compose one of the catchiest songs of the 80s, an extremely annoyingly catchy song, some might say. It's called Danger Zone. It was made especially popular because it featured on the soundtrack of the movie Top Gun that came out in 86. His lyrics took you on a highway to the danger zone, or at least they tried. Well, our Sam this morning wants to kind of do the opposite, which is nice, if you don't happen to be a fan of either Top Gun or Danger Zone. So I think Sam 91 wants to take you into the safety zone from whatever petrifies you now. So what does petrify you just now? If anything, does abandonment or loneliness, unemployment or criticism, exposure of some misdemeanor, COVID or cancer or dying or the Lord's words on Judgment Day, I never knew you. I think there's a few there that scare me a little, but that last one's the one that terrifies me most. What about you? Well, the psalmist here is surrounded by dangers just like you. But he feels safe. Why? Well, because of his faith in a God who knows how to protect, who can protect powerfully who can protect perfectly because the psalmist shelters and abides in the shadow of the Almighty. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. If you shelter with the Most High, then within his shadow, you find your own safe place. And the psalmist can express his own confidence, his sense of security, and his own personal praise to Yahweh. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And this safety zone, as it were, is not an exclusive club for the super spiritual. If the psalmist can know this, then so can you, fellow believer. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord your dwelling place 
the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Got that? That's for you. (laughs) That is a lot of personal protective equipment laid out for you there. A really comprehensive set of PPE. It's a lot like an insurance company advert, isn't it? Whatever you can think of, apparently, you're covered. Well, the what about this? Is that covered? Yep, that's included. Ah, but what about this? For sure, yep. You're good for that too. Because the psalmist God is your God, you make your shelter under him. And his full comprehensive protection is available for all who do. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler, verse 4. That's just military shorthand for total protection. And the image I have now is of Tony Stark donning his uber-protective, uber-awesome Iron Man suit. And arrows and lions and snakes and snares and pestilence, whatever else you can think of, just ping off his armor. You're that safe. I don't know if you ever heard the First World War account that's told about this commander who gave out little cards to his soldiers with Psalm 91 written on it. Apparently he gave it to all his men who were in the brigade of the same number, the 91st Brigade. And they all agreed to recite this psalm daily. And after they started praying this prayer, they were involved in three of the bloodiest battles in World War I. And yet there were no casualties in combat, despite other brigades suffering as much as 90%. Why it wasn't 91% is a shame, because then we'd have a full set of 91s. But anyway, nothing is beyond Yahweh's power to protect And for sure, he himself is more powerful than any Marvel superhero you can think of. Infinitely more so. And he is a punisher of the wicked, verse 8. The baddies and the super baddies. The villains and the super villains. Get their comeuppance by him. And so he can keep you safe in whatever problems or dangers that come along. Sounds good, doesn't it? Who's not signing up for that? I mean, who in the right mind wouldn't sign up? But is it quite so straightforward? Well, you know, that World War I story is a myth. There never even was a 91st Regiment. Amazing how these stories get told. And people can get a bit giddy, shall we say, about the protection that we're offered in Psalm 91. 
For example, Brian Tamaki, a pastor in Auckland, New Zealand, he told his congregation last year that in Psalm 91, for Bible-believing, born-again Christians who pay their tithes, God assures them total protection from COVID-19. Yeah, I wish I'd heard about that before I got my two shots of AstraZeneca. That would have saved me a right sore arm and all the rest. Now, if your sarcasm detector is still a bit sleepy this morning, then I just want to be clear. I happen to be very pro-vax and hope you can reject Pastor Tamaki's ridiculous claim as well. The 91st Psalm is not a lucky charm to be carried around in your heart or in your back pocket. Like if you recite it five times before breakfast and twice more after lunch, you'll never have problems again. The Israelites thought they could use the Ark of the Covenant like that in 1 Samuel 4. Take it into battle with them, so they thought, and they'd have total immunity from the Philistines. God really punctured that superstition by not only letting his people lose the battle, but letting the Philistines capture the ark as well. And it's been recorded that by the time of Jesus' ministry, Psalm 91 had long been used as a mantra by Jewish exorcists because they thought it helped to force demons away. And also that verses from the psalm have since been worn on amulets as a form of magical protection, be that on necklaces or bracelets or whatever. I think naturally it's in everyone to want a cure-all magic pill. And gain a Terminator-style protection that can say hasta la vista to all your problems. And for the somewhat spiritually minded, it's Psalm 91 that appears to be that pill. If you can be a faithful Psalm 91-er and a tithe-paying believer too, don't forget your tithes, then immunity from plagues and pandemics and problems is possible. That's a very attractive proposition. And who really wants you to interpret it that way? Satan. How can you be sure Satan wants you to? Because that's the way he wanted Jesus to interpret it. In Jesus' wanderings in the wilderness, Satan quoted Psalm 91. And if we read in from Luke chapter 4, verse 9, it says, And he took Jesus to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, in Psalm 91, verse 11, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. That's Psalm 91, verse 12. And the three wilderness temptations recorded for us in the Gospels are all part of Satan's scheme to have Jesus achieve a glory without suffering. He wanted Jesus to turn stones into bread because fasting is painful. 
He wanted Jesus to avoid the cross and bow down and worship him. Because he had power over the kingdoms of the world. That he could give a second-hand glory to Jesus right there. Pain-free. And if he could get Jesus to jump off the temple, and Jesus didn't get a nice pillow soft landing, then Satan could make out that God is a liar. He doesn't keep his promise about angels guarding us from getting hurt. And if that's what Satan wanted the Son of God to believe, then how much more does he want you to believe that? So the promises of this psalm are not a license for recklessness. It's true God may well have rescued you after some jackass behavior. After you've conducted yourself carelessly. I know he has for me on more than one occasion. But don't count on that rescue as a result of your recklessness, says Jesus. Don't put God to the test. And this was Jesus' response to Satan's little Bible quote. Jesus came back at him with a balancing scripture from Deuteronomy 6, 16. It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Because scripture is brilliant at balancing scripture. At interpreting scripture. The clearer scriptures especially help interpret the less clear ones. So if you don't want to compare an isolated portion of scripture with other scriptures, then you're probably not understanding it as God intends you to. Because scripture is your best interpreter. It is consistent within itself, and so it balances out imbalances. Because although there are apparent contradictions or paradoxes in the Bible, there are no true contradictions. It is infallible. And that is what we have to do here with Psalm 91. Compare it to other scriptures to understand what God is promising here. And we'll come back to this in a moment. But first, folks, take note that it is God himself who speaks the last three verses of the psalm. Verse 14 and following. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Obviously, the psalmist up till now has been in an elevated mood, singing God's praises, perhaps after a great deliverance. And now God speaks about his own ability to deliver and protect and answer prayer and rescue and honor and extend life and display salvation. 
But there's a revealing phrase in there as well. I will be with him in trouble. He doesn't ever promise a life that's you and me problem free. He says he'll be with us in our trouble. God wants you to live out your days with peace in your heart and an absence of paralyzing fear. He doesn't promise you an easy ride as a true believer. He actually promises that you won't in other parts of Scripture. I have told you these things, Jesus said, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Many of you, I reckon, here and back home, can recount some great deliverance by God. Bet you can. Perhaps even quite a few instances of miraculous or semi-miraculous protection. And that's God's grace to you. And let's praise him exuberantly for that. We don't play that down. But you'll also be able to say that you've had trouble. You've known trouble. You're in trouble. And there's been no jaw-dropping rescue every time. except that God's been with you in the trouble. That many times you've found shelter under his wings, as it were. He's given you peace within the trouble. Your heart's found comfort there because he is strong and loving. Because Jesus has overcome the world. So, what is God really promising? So like Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, if you've made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high your refuge, then you can be hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Some of what petrifies you now may happen. But ultimately, there's no need to feel crushed or in despair or abandoned or destroyed. None of that comes near your tent. No such evil shall be allowed to befall you. I think it's when we add our own understanding of what we believe to be true happiness into the promises of God that we feel let down when things go wrong. And so we get angry, confused. We doubt the promises' validity 
we doubt our faith and our salvation. How graciously God reshapes our understanding in his word. Many of the Psalms, says Benita Risner, are wonderful prayers for this life, but promises only for eternity. And she's written a couple of books on suffering called Walking Through Fire and The Scars That Have Shaped Me. Now, my wife has a secret pizza recipe that has to be tasted to be believed. Laura knows. <laughs> Who here is a fan of pizza? Are you a Pizza Express person or a Pizza Hut person? I know you can't say, <laughs> but whatever. Whenever it's pizza night at the farm, I can tell you no one holds back. And copious, copious amounts are consumed. Everyone eats from the littlest to the biggest until they are satisfied. And if there are any bits left, then they tend to be found on the kids' plates. couple of outer edges, perhaps dismissed because they're not all slathered in cheese and tomato and chorizo and olive. And you know, sometimes heaven can be dismissed like it's a piece of pizza crust. And we all gorge on the here and now like that's the giant portion. But if we get our spiritual bearings right, then we remember that it's not. That this life is the crust that can be left behind. And the real feast is the life that is to come. Heaven is where the promises of Psalm 91 will receive their complete fulfillment. The ever quotable Thomas Watson writes about the link between pain and glory. He says, the wisdom of God is seen in making the most desperate evils turn to the good of his children as several, as several poisonable ingredients, wisely tempered by the skill of the artist, make a sovereign medicine. So God makes the most deadly afflictions cooperate for the good of his children. He purifies them and prepares them for heaven. These hard frosts hasten the spring flowers of glory. I think the point of Psalm 91 is this. God will preserve you 100% from every danger in this life if that is God's purpose for you. He truly commands his angels to guard you in all your ways. And if at some stage in life you're not preserved, then it is because it's also God's purpose to spare you any more suffering by bringing you home. Let me say that again. God will gl gladly empty heaven of his angels if it is his purpose to preserve you. 
And if not, it's because he wants to make an end of all your suffering. He wants you to hear from him. Not the words, I never knew you. But well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Where Psalm 91 would have you end up. That's where his highway to the safety zone wants to take you. Jesus said further on in Luke 21, 16 to 18, that some of his flock would die in a cruel and unjust way. And then he immediately followed that by saying, but not a hair of your head will perish. He could make some shocking statements. You'll be delivered up by relatives and friends. You'll be hated for my name's sake. And he could say that some of you will be put to death. But not a hair of your head will perish. Because he will be bringing you home to imperishable life with him. Not a hair on Jesus' head ultimately perished. Jesus was preserved by God from Herod's sword when Herod was killing all the under twos, when Jesus was tiny, because that was God's purpose for him. Jesus was preserved from Jewish stonings and he could walk right through the crowd, Iron Man style. Because that was God's purpose for him. And Jesus sheltered under the Almighty fully and perfectly to obtain your perfect righteousness. And Jesus went through utter hell and abandonment on the cross for you without any armor or protection to pay for your sins and my sins. Because that was God's purpose. And he was raised to life again, his hair undamaged, as it were. Because that was God's purpose. He knows what he's doing. So trust in Jesus. Trust in God. Come to him. Take shelter there. Because you won't regret it when you do. Because God loves you and knows what is best overall for you. And if you find that hard to believe today, then one day, believer, you'll find it so easy to. When you look back from the absolute beyond safest of safety zones, it will all seem worth it from the perspective of your true home, I think you and I will say, I wouldn't have changed a single thing. May God grant us the faith and hope and love to believe his word. Let us pray together. Almighty God and 
protective heavenly father. We bow before you and just seek to receive your word like little children. Trusting that their perfectly father knows what he is talking about. We thank you that you speak to us because we do get so confused, so muddled, so messed up. But you are here and you do speak and you do comfort us and transform our minds our hearts to receive what you have for us to accept it and rejoice in it and lay it as the foundations for our confidence and our hope in this life we are so grateful for your precious promises that you tell us no lies, that the truth is greater than we can imagine, bigger than we can get our heads around. We want to go deeper into you, closer to your heart, which has the capacity to embrace us all, everyone that Christ has died for around the world. May they find shelter. May we find shelter under your shadow. Sense your smile upon us now. Accept your grace to us today. Rejoice in it and remember that it is a free gift from Jesus' terrible death, his death for our eternal life, his hell for our heaven. our heaven spent with a risen Savior whom we will get to know better and more fully more wonderfully every day kickstart our journey now we pray before we get bumped up to that spectacular version of eternal life we ask all in Jesus name and for his sake Amen. We're going to sing if you're at home in Zoom. 